The next character we will introduce is Shigeki Tuk, who was mentioned in the first episode of Genghis Khan, Conquering to the Hens of the Earth. If you have not yet watched Genghis Khan, Conquering to the Hens of the Earth, feel free to click the link to watch. Next, we'll tell the story of Shigeki Tuk, the most outstanding adopted son. Exciting content is about to be revealed, so stay tuned. In the golden autumn morning light, a devastating war burned out on the prairie, leaving only cold corpses and an empty silence. The Tatar tribe's camp had turned to ashes, and the Mongolian cavalry demonstrated unmatched bravery and fierceness in battle. From the burning camp, a brave young boy emerged. He was Shigikituk. He was young, but brimming with heroic spirit and ambition. His eyes were full of fearlessness and determination, as if foreshadowing that he would become a great leader. When Temujin's gaze fell on him, he immediately recognized his talent and potential. Temujin had him brought back to his own camp, deciding to keep him and entrust him to his mother Hola for upbringing, hoping that he could contribute to the great cause of Mongolia in the future. Shigikutuk's bravery and judgment earned Temujin's respect. One day, as Genghis Khan led his tribe to migrate across a snow-covered plain, a herd of deer ran by. Shigeki Tuk expressed to Kichigetu, the steward of Genghis Khan's royal tent, that he wanted to chase the deer. His request was approved, and he set off alone to pursue his prey. However, when sunset came and Genghis Khan asked about Shigeki Tuk's whereabouts, he learned that he had not returned from hunting. Genghis Khan was furious, yelling, "Does this boy want to freeze to death?" He glared at the steward and beat him with the cart shaft. He couldn't believe that the boy he valued so highly would be so reckless, go in hunting alone, braving the cold and danger. When the plain was covered with white snow, and the moonlight drew a silent and icy silver band on the snow, Shigeki Tuk unexpectedly returned. He was carrying dozens of arrows, each embedded in the body of a deer, showing that he had successfully hunted these deer. He walked into the camp, head high and strides wide. And reported his results with a strong voice. I have killed 27 deer. His voice echoed in the cold wind, attracting the attention of the entire camp. Such courage and hunting skills surprised Genghis Khan. He was amazed at Shigi Kituk's hunting skills, but even more at his bravery and determination. Genghis Khan ordered someone to verify his game, and found everything to be as he said. This act not only caused Temujin to see Shigi Kituk in a new light. But also made him regard Shigeki Tuk as his confidant, sharing glory and pain with him. Since then, Shigeki Tuk has become Genghis Khan's right-hand man, riding together across the land of the Northern Desert. He not only gave Temujin sophisticated military advice, but also always led from the front in battle, fearing no danger. He carved his own path in Temujin's conquering wars. Making great contributions to the unification of the various tribes in the northern desert. In 1211, Genghis Khan led a large Mongolian army to attack the Jin Dynasty. After four years of fierce fighting, by 1215, Genghis Khan's army had occupied Yan, Ji, and other counties, and successfully won over the Jin's defense general Puchikijin. By May, they successfully captured the Jin's capital city, Jongdu. Temujin then sent Shigeki Tuk, Ah Hai, and Wang Er to represent him in taking over all affairs in Jongdu, including receiving gold, silver, and jewels from the Jin court treasury, and looking for talents like Guo Bai and Yellow Chu Chi mentioned by Ming Genku. Shigeki Tuk immediately started work, first issuing a declaration to calm the people, leading soldiers to put out the big fire in Jongdu. And tidying up the defeated Jong to government offices, he also sent people to inquire about talents still remaining in Jongdu, and instructed soldiers not to frighten these people. Under his meticulous arrangement, they successfully found Guo Bai and Yellow Chu Chi, and immediately sent them to Genghis Khan's tent. Genghis Khan, following the advice of Chu Chi, sent a new edict to the three men responsible for post-war affairs, changing the old reception mode. He required all the people who didn't die in the war, whether they were Jin soldiers, ordinary citizens, or people within Jongdu city, to 
to be gathered in a place outside the city. He emphasized that when dealing with these people, they could no longer select women like in the past, but prioritize men with special skills and education. At the end of the edict, he warned his subordinates not to let personal emotions interfere. Even if they strongly disliked someone, as long as they had special skills and education, they were to be sent to his camp. Shigiku took, who received the order, strictly executed these instructions after the establishment of Mongolia. Genghis Khan made him a chieftain and gave him the official position of the great Jalahuchi, responsible for dealing with punishments, disputes, and distribution of households. He recorded all the households given to kings, nobles, and honored ministers, all the verdicts and various rules approved by him in the Blue Book, and ordered that no one could change them without authorization. As time passed, Shigi Kutuk's reputation in the Mongolian army grew louder and louder. His wisdom and bravery made him an important figure in Mongolia, and he never let down Genghis Khan's expectations. With his brave war exploits, thoughtful strategies, and unparalleled loyalty, he left deep traces in the history of Mongolia. However, no matter how significant his military successes were, Shigi Kutuk always maintained humility and dedication. He believed that only by respecting every individual could true peace and prosperity be achieved. This spirit won him admiration and love in the Mongol army. In 1221, ten years later, Shigi Kutuk followed Genghis Khan to the west and led an army of 30,000 to attack Khorasm's Prince Jal ad Din and Mergan Khan of the Yeli tribe. The two armies clashed at Baluan River. But the battle did not go well, and Kami led by Shigi Kutuk suffered a major setback, with the majority of the Mongol soldiers perishing in battle. In 1230, the Mongols launched a major attack on the Jin dynasty again in this battle. Shigi Kutuk played an important role in the right-wing army led by Talu, participating in the famous Battle of Mount Three Peaks in Junjo. Despite past setbacks, Shigi Kutuk's courage and wisdom kept him playing a key role in battles. In 1234, the Jin dynasty was declared extinct under the attack of the Mongol army at the end of that year. Ogadai Khan appointed Shigi Kutuk as the official in charge of the Jonjo region and set up an office in Yanji, making him the highest supervisor of politics, criminal justice, and finance in all roads in central China. The Han people at that time called this newly established institution Yanjing Xing Tai Shangshu Province. Upon taking office, Shigi Kutuk immediately began to coordinate and compile a register of households in central China. This large-scale administrative work continued until 1235, resulting in a census of over 1.1 million households, known as the Yiwei Household Register. The following year, he was ordered to distribute households in the Han region of central China to Mongol kings, nobles, and honored ministers. However, Shigi Kutuk's governance in Yanjing Xing Tai Shangshu province made people feel oppressed. Governance is complicated, taxes are heavy, and urgency is like a wildfire. This was the Han people's evaluation of him. Despite the existence of Yelu Chusi's tax law, he did not stop levying taxes on the Han people, he required the Han people to pay taxes in silver. And even the small teaching industry could not obtain tax exemption. During the census, he even proposed a ridiculous idea to stamp identification marks on people's arms. Just like treating livestock, fortunately, this bad policy was forced to stop under the strong opposition of Mankhaya. But due to the heavy corvi and high taxes under Shigi Kutuk's regime, the Han people in the Central Plains region could no longer bear it and fled their homes in large numbers. Shigi Kutuk's rule brought people deep oppression and pain and at the same time provoked deep resentment against Mongol rule. The early spring sunlight touched the frozen earth, the silently waiting myriad things of winter and also shown onto the battlefield filled with gunpowder and flames in this year. The Mongol army, under the command of Gagedai Khan, began the war against the Song dynasty. Shigi Kutuk was appointed, along with Prince Kuotoi, to jointly command the Eastern army. Their target was the Jingxiong and Lianghui region of the Song dynasty. Behind them was the fiscal and military supply of Hebei 
and Shandong, all under the responsibility of Shigeki Tuk. It was a formidable logistical support that allowed them to confidently push forward their attack in the early summer of 1241. The decree of Gagedai Khan flew out from the palace to Shigeki Tuk's residence. This decree caused his brows to furrow slightly upon first reading. The decree stated, Yoluochi is appointed to be in charge of Hon affairs. This meant that the position of the central region official, which he had been in charge of since the defeat of the Gen in 1234, would no longer be his responsibility. The administration of Hon affairs would be handed over to Yoluochi. Shigi Kutuk sat in his residence, his fingers gently touching the thick decree with thousands of thoughts in his mind. He knew that the issuance of this decree would put an end to his seven-year career as the central region official. He remembered those years, the various experiences he had witnessed in the position of the central region official, and the storms he had weathered, the people and events that deeply moved him, and the gains and puzzles that he found hard to let go. All came flooding back to him in this moment. He carefully folded the decree and placed it on his desk. Then he walked out of his residence, looking towards the distant sky. There was the direction of Mongolia, where he had once fought alongside Genghis Khan, and it was also his homeland in his heart. Shigi Kutuk took a deep breath, clutching the decree in his hand. Regardless of what the future held, he would accept it and move forward bravely. Because this was his responsibility and his honor as a Mongol. In 1247, when the snow covered central China and the severe cold enveloped people's hearts, Zhang Dehui, a Hon official, stepped alone into Kabloi Khan's bedchamber. In his hands, he held a memorial. And on his face was a sincere and resolute expression. He knelt in front of Kabloi Khan. Presenting the memorial, it read, Please reappoint Shigi Kutuk in charge of civil affairs. The content of this memorial gave Kabloi Khan a thoughtful look. He knew that Shigi Kutuk had left his position and was no longer an official. And the suggestion of this memorial meant to re-employ him, allowing him to once again manage the civil affairs of central China. Kabloi Khan understood that Zhang Dehui's suggestion was not without basis. During Shigi Kutuk's tenure as the official of central region, he was responsible for the household registration, while he prioritized the interests of the Mongolian nobility and the looting of the Han territories resulted in heavy tax burdens for the people. These actions indeed met the war needs against the Song to some extent, even his practice of dividing the land and people, allocating the acquired Han populace to the members of Genghis Khan's golden family, and rewarding nobles and meritorious officials, despite causing some people to flee, was in accordance with the old Mongolian system, and was not completely indifferent to the suffering of the people. Kabloi Khan carefully read the memorial. Considering Jean Dehui's suggestion, he knew that his decision would affect the fate of the people of central China and the future of the Mongolian army. Therefore, he needed to make a wise and comprehensive decision, which was both an expectation and a test for him. However, the flow of history is always turbulent and unpredictable. The storm of Rik Baik's rebellion swept across the entire Mongolia also affecting the fate of Shigi Kutuk. He unfortunately fell victim in this chaos, ending his life. At the time of his death, he was 80 years old. His life witnessed the rise and transformation of Mongolia, as well as the vicissitudes and changes of central China. His life was full of the smoke of war and the hardship of governance, but also filled with the brilliance of wisdom and contribution. The life of Shigi Kutuk was undoubtedly full of controversy and contradiction. He was both a distinguished general of the Mongol Empire and an official who brought burdens to the people, however. It is this contradiction and controversy that make him a unique and historically significant figure. His life is both a testament to the rise and expansion of the Mongol Empire and a reflection of the suffering and struggle of the people of central China. If you like this story, please help us by subscribing and sharing. Thank you.